That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to HDO's webinar series on having children. Uh, today, we're looking at prenatal, um, and we have with us today uh, two young people from the HD community um, who are still very young. <laughs> And we've got uh, Danielle and Riley here with us. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I appreciate you wanting to participate. Um, uh, so Danielle, Riley, would you like to introduce yourselves and just kind of talk a little bit about your connection to Huntington's disease? Um, and then we'll talk about a bit more about prenatal and what that is. OK, so Danielle, do you want to start? Sounds good. Thanks, Matt. Um, so my name is Danielle Valenti, and I'm actually a board member for HDO. Um, this is my first year on the board, and I, my mom tested positive for Huntington's a few years ago and actually passed away in 2014. Um, I was tested positive in 2015, and then I got um, involved heavily on different boards and just research opportunities. Um, I have a daughter who's HD negative, uh, and we'll get into that, how she came about, and um, a husband. I got married in August, and I live in Albany, New York, where there is about two feet of snow right now. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> it is looking Christmassy. Yeah. <laughs> and Riley? Yeah, my name is Riley. Um, I my connection to HD um, it is it goes back actually pretty far. Um, I think my great great grandpa was one that was the first one we knew. Um, but then my yeah, so my grandma had it. My dad has it. My uncle has it. Um, and I am one of three siblings, but luckily I'm the only one that has it. I tested positive three years ago. So I'm 29 and I have a 46 tag count. Um, and yeah, um, that's my connection to HD. <laughs> um, and ever since then, well, I guess I found out when I was 12. Um, and so being able to, like understanding that I was going to have a very different reproductive path in front of me than the normal person was something that I've been thinking about for probably the last decade. So it wasn't a surprise when I got married and I tested positive that we were going to do that because we'd agreed to it before we were even seriously dating because I wouldn't, <laughs> I'd never dated anybody that wasn't going to be on board with that. Um, but I, right now I am currently pregnant with an HD free child that is due in April. Congratulations, Riley. Very Thank exciting. You. Thanks. Well, a little bundle of joy coming your way. <laughs> a lot of sleepless nights, but it's worth it. I say that as I can hear my son upstairs crying. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think I just hear crying in my ears right now from having <laughs> nothing one. No, that's real crying. I can hear yeah. it. Right but it's not my problem. It's my wife's right now. Exactly. Um, I, I guess I'll kind of jump in there. You were talking about my situation was kind of opposite of, of Riley's. Um, I didn't know anything about Huntington's until probably like two, like 2013, 2014. Um, so when I found out that my mom had it, it was a surprise. And I, I knew that I would have to figure, figure things out. But at the time I was single, I had no idea if I was even going to have kids. So it wasn't something that I had to really think through at the time. Um, but I'm, I'm currently 34. And when my daughter, um, ex I actually found out uh, for a surprise that she, uh, I was pregnant and with my longtime boyfriend. And uh, then I had to really start thinking about, okay, what are those next steps? And I, I was kind of forced into seeing my genetic counselor that did my um, HD testing. And she walked me through um, talking to a genetic counselor and they, they kind of laid out all of the different options at that point. And that leads on to my next question, which is really what, get, what got you to decide to go with prenatal as the option? Um, what kind of options did you have at that stage when you went to the clinic? Because obviously you were already pregnant at that stage. So, yeah. So, well, I guess it's interesting if I even back up. I had, I knew that I would always be like the last generation um, 
in my family for HD. So even when I, even though I found out later in life, I knew that I was either going to do IVF or not have kids. Uh, but I did, cause I didn't know that there were other options. So when I went there, she, she was basically like, okay, well you can, because you're already pregnant, uh, IVF is obviously off the, the table. So you're either going to have, a, you're just going to go through this, a regular birth and, and kind of blindly and not know the status of the baby, or we can do um, genetic testing and then kind of talked about the uh, kind of the, the moral issues with that and with um, abortion and uh, the two different options of, I think it was amnio or the chronic, the CVS um, were the two were the two different options that we talked through. What about you, Riley? Did you have options between the CVS or amnio? Uh, yeah, actually, I did. I think I I felt like I had the option of doing IVF. Um, and initially, that's what I thought I was going to do for basically my entire life. And then um, when we started talking more seriously about having kids, I found this podcast uh, called IVFML. <laughs> and it basically chronicled the journey of this couple through IVF, like very detailed. And I realized like how much it really like puts on a woman's body and like how much stress is created through all of that effort and, you know, I, how many needles there are which I'm not <laughs> I'm not a needle person yeah <laughs> um, and I was kind of like well not just that but you know in Missouri uh, because it's different for every state in the U.S. Um, nothing is covered so you know unless somebody wanted to donate 40 or 50 thousand dollars to me you know or I wanted to take out a second mortgage on my house you know there just wasn't uh, financial financial means that was reasonable um, and it was something that I was willing to take on. And so that's when I kind of started looking for alternative options. And it was really hard for me to find access to those. Um, I was on Google a lot and a lot of the HD websites that I landed on would have like one sentence pertaining to the fact that there was testing that you could do if you were pregnant, but just no information on what that entailed. So uh, I w ended up finding a genetic counselor at uh, the hospital near me and I just made an appointment with her out of the blue and um, she kind of talked me through my options more because they did uh, the CV sampling which they said they could do at nine weeks which was really nice and or we could do the amnio which would be much later so I opted for the CV sampling um, they ended up being able to schedule me at 10 weeks and um <clears throat> It actually wasn't as terrifying as I thought it was going to be. Um, and they just like, they have a little catheter with a little grabby thing. So they kind of like stick the catheter up inside of you and grab a little bit of the placenta and like pull it back out through the catheter. So there was no needles. Um, so that was what I wound up deciding to do. Um, Wait, so you, got, didn't, you didn't have to have a needle in your ears was, um, it didn't have to go through your abdomen? No, um, so I have an anterior placenta, which mm -hmm. for everyone who doesn't know, that means the placenta is like right in the front of my stomach. So they had super easy access to the placenta and the baby wasn't in the way at all. So the lady basically stood over me with, um, with a, the technician did with a sonogram on and the doctor was down below <laughs> and she just kind of went up uh, and watching the screen uh, to get the, to take this little catheter thing. Uh, it probably wasn't like wider than a mil, like a millimeter. It was very tiny and it's rounded at the top. So I didn't feel anything. It wasn't painful at all. Um, the only thing that sucked was that you have to have your bladder completely full so they can see everything. Yeah. <laughs> so I really just had to go to the bathroom the whole time. That was pretty much the only thing that kind of sucked, but it took less than five minutes for them to do it like that. So that was some really nice. Yeah, mine was different. So I had to do through my abdomen. So they had to do a needle through my stomach. Um, you know, it wasn't the worst procedure that I've ever had, but I will say that it's just, I mean, having a large needle, I think watching it is worse, right? Watching this large needle go through your abdomen into like your placenta. Um, 
it's just not awesome. And then you can see it on the ultrasound. And they had they actually had to do it twice because the first time they went in, they didn't get enough. And she's like, ah, I'm not gonna send this out without enough. And I was like, you, that is not fun. Um, I, yeah, I did not, uh, I think the anticipation made me, I was like dizzy and sweating. <laughs> I was really nervous. I don't like needles either. Um, I don't think anybody does, but um, it didn't like after it didn't hurt. It was just during it, it was very uncomfortable, but I think that was just more of the needle. And there was like people watching and yeah, you know, it was a whole, a whole thing. I think my, oh, yeah. my husband was about to pass out. He hates needles. And he was like, this is the worst thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait until I actually give birth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I've learned oh, real. that it's okay for me to like say no. <laughs> When the doctor comes in, is like, can these four people come in? Be like, actually, no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't want all of these people in here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. This is weird enough. But yeah, all in all, I mean, for for what it for what it was. Um. Yeah, I had mine at. I had so I went with the sampling too, and I had mine. I think at. Gosh, when is later? I want to say eleven or twelve weeks, and then it took. The only part of it was like it took forever for the results to come back. Um, for me, it was like, how long does it usually take? Mine took like three and a half weeks. So at that point, yeah. So if I was what, like 12 weeks when I had it, I I was pretty far along. Um, so that was hard, but then they called me, maybe they called me at three weeks to say that the, that they feel like, uh, she was like, okay, we got the preliminary results and I can't like with 100% accuracy or accuracy say that, that you don't that the fetus doesn't have it, but it doesn't. Um, so that was that was an awesome call. Um, but it, the waiting period, it felt like I was going through my genetic testing again, <laughs> honestly, yeah. that waiting yeah. period. And I was like, I can't, I was so stressed out. And then you're pregnant. So it's like, you, mm-hmm. like you're tired, you're in your first trimester and you're like, all right, well, what can I do to distract myself? Oh, nothing, because I'm so tired. Yeah, I think uh, for me, it took, it was exactly 10 business days. And I remember because when, because I had asked, actually, I think my recommendation for anyone at this point would be to ask their genetic counselor how long the test is going to take, because I think that they're the only person that actually knows the answer to that. Uh, They sent mine to John Hopkins. And so John Hopkins was always, has always consistently gotten it back within 10 business days. So when they hadn't called me on the 10th business day, <laughs> I called, I called the doctor or the genetic counselor because I That's hadn't heard of her. And then I, and then I called the lab and I was like, excuse me, I haven't heard anything. <laughs> and the, um, then my genetic counselor called me back right after I left a message at the lab asking them about my results. <laughs> and, um, I could just tell from her voice, like I knew just immediately that, uh, that it was negative because of, she was so happy to just be on the no. phone with me. And that is not what happened when I got my yeah. <laughs> I agree. I Same. In, and he was yeah. so awkward. And I was like, Oh, I know I have it because I can tell from your body language. Yeah. Um, you're avoiding, really you don't nice. want to look at me. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so that yeah, was really nice. I think that the way we coped with the waiting though was just, and I don't know what you did, Danielle, so maybe this is totally different, but we really like kept it to ourselves. And um, there's a couple of friends that knew that we were going through it. Um, and like my dad, and I was really lucky enough that my siblings and my dad were really supportive of that, and my sister in law as well. And we just kind of announced it to them and it's a soft, soft excitement and we will see how it goes. And so there wasn't a lot of like baby talk and there wasn't, it was like, okay, like if this, if this works out language, instead of like, Oh, I'm so excited to do all of these things. It was just like a lot more cautionary. Yeah. Um, but I don't feel like, I don't feel like that damaged my relationship, like with my future child. I feel I still feel connected to it. <laughs> I don't know if it's a girl or a boy, so that's, it's still an it. But <laughs> um, yeah, I I think that's how I coped with it in the best way that we could. Um, but I think it was probably harder on my husband than it was on me. Yeah. I don't think you're doing any disservice to your child to, to no. that way. 
you have to cope with, with what you're going through at that time. Exactly. What did you do, Danielle? Um, I think it was it was a little different for me because she was a surprise. So I had, like I was digesting the fact that I was pregnant, um, and I did everything backwards. So I hadn't like Chris and I weren't married yet. He was a little farther away, planning on moving here, but he still didn't even live in Albany. So we had all of these things. It was kind of like a mass conversation of like, okay, well, uh, what we just had to figure out our life. But we also, it was just being patient. Um, we did tell some people, I'm not really good at keeping secrets. Um, I wear everything on my sleeve. So people would be like, what's wrong with you? And they're like nervously like pacing. Um, but it was, people were very supportive and I uh, didn't ask too many questions because I was very, like, I think you just have to also like be very confident in your decision and who you're telling. And like, this is what's happening because, it, you know, especially with the abortion part, you know, with a lot of these, one of the things that I think people that it's important for people to realize is that when you're going through this type of testing for something like Huntington's, that there's a lot of, um, a lot of conversations with the counselors because it's, you know, it's really up to them if they will on a per family basis, if they're going to do this genetic testing for you because of all of the laws and rules on um, the testing. Like uh, Riley said that you can't get tested in a conversation earlier with you until you're 18 here in America. So, you know, that it's, it's a whole other thing with, that it was a whole different conversation going into like the morals and rules of the hospitals. But I knew what I wanted, um, so it was okay. And some people, you know, f friends and family members, they were all supportive, but I, you know, I'm sure some of them were against like, oh, so you're gonna abort the child if it has a disease and you just have to say like, this is my decision um, and be very comfortable with that with whoever you're telling or don't tell anyone and you can be quiet about it. It's a very personal thing. Yeah, and I think that's why yeah, I you have to be cautious. Oh, right? You're going, you're in that, you're waiting for that news. And until you know if it's going to be a negative result, then great, you can you can do what you want with your pregnancy. Um, but if it's positive, then, then, you know, that's, you know, do you want people to know? Or who do you want to know? It's something to really take seriously, isn't it? Yeah, very. And doctors take it very seriously, too. Yeah. Um, I found a lot of support in another group that, I was in um, that was just genetic uh, it was genetic carriers so outside of the HD community there's you know cystic fibrosis and there's a lot of people that are in the same situation as we are in with HD <clears throat> and I didn't even think about that when I was going through it and I was really lucky that somebody uh, pointed me in the direction of a support group on Facebook and I would definitely really encourage that and also I mean if you can if you can afford it, you're okay with it. Therapy, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I definitely have a therapist, and so oh, yeah. I think that kind of self care is so important, and like maintaining your mental health is so important too. And I think that you're right, being confident in your decision just is so helpful. Yeah, I mean, I second you with therapy. I definitely I have a therapist. I've been with him for a long time, but he like basically since my mom passed away. Um, so he's seen me through all of these, these stages and just super helpful to, to sound off on. Um, but definitely joining different support groups and talking about people. You know, we, Riley and I we were talking about this earlier, how we feel like IVF is always talked about in, in the HD community, but probably other, like you said, other just disease communities um, mm -hmm. that we let this, but this is a real option for people who can't afford or accidentally get pregnant. And if you still want to be careful and confident in your decision, this, this is a, this is a real thing. Um, yeah. because it's not cheap and IVF also the hormones and the, the process, it's not like that's an easy thing, uh, either. I questioned if my body, I have other health issues and I, there were times um, you know, if I'm going to do uh, IVF, can my body really handle all of those hormones? And so that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, there's uh, one of the women, the one that pointed me towards the support group, actually, um, she was not, she was denied IVF. So they got all the testing done and went to get started. And her doctor and her IVF doctor was like, 
you don't qualify for IVF, you literally cannot do it. So this yeah. was like, it was, for this, for her, it was either this. And then people usually say like, oh, well, you can do adoption, but adoption costs a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's like, you know, that's a great idea. And I would love that, but I don't have a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and sur- people be, yeah, and then the people would say, "Oh, well, you can do surrogacy, like, or you, you know, freeze your eggs, do that." It all costs money, and it's emotional. Like any of this stuff is, it takes a lot of time, effort, and emotions. And for people who are trying to care for a parent or someone in, that ha- might have the disease, or you know, it's it's all exhausting. Yeah, especially when I mean, especially when you consider the fact that, like, you know, I mean, Danielle and I have it. So, you know, there's also that level of like, I don't want to, you know, spend my healthy years being super stressed out because that only, only makes it worse in the long run for myself. So, I mean, the idea of going through an IVF process that was going to take, you know, nine or 10 months, I was like, I don't yeah. know if, <laughs> I don't know if yeah. I can do that. The trauma, right? we talk about that. I, you know, I, was, I had this conversation with one of my friends um, who is in the HD community and she was, you know, we were talking about how if if trauma, um, you know, can expedite Huntington's like is pregnancy or IVF. Could it do that? Like nobody obviously knows, but it's a real, it's something that you think about. I mean, obviously any of us that have the gene are counting our, like luckily counting our days and grateful, but it's, it's, it's real. Well, I think, yes, I think stress is, a, is a, an impact. It does have a factor on, on, you know, when you start symptoms. So you don't want to have a, that much stress. And, and yeah, PTD, IVF is, is a very stressful uh, journey to go on for sure. Having gone down that route myself um, with my wife. Um, so I can totally agree that it, it's a very taxing journey to go on. Um, so you have to be sure about what what's right for you guys, don't you? Um, I'm just wondering, what was the cost for you guys for for um, prenatal? Um, fully covered by insurance. Just, all covered by insurance for you, Danielle? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, maybe at the co- I had to pay like the small copays, but uh, all all of the testing, uh, specialized testing, a hundred percent was covered. Um, so in Missouri, uh, insurance is not required to cover any, uh, fertur- fertility, anything. Um, so it was $5,000 to have the hospital do oh, wow. it and another, another three grand to have the, um, to have eight or the, uh, clinic process it, the lab process it. Um, we paid cash, so we didn't go through. We didn't try and bank it through insurance because we knew that they would deny it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we didn't even. We just did it ourselves. Um, and yeah, I was really lucky that my dad is in a financial situation where he planned on us maybe needing help with some fertility stuff, so he was able to help us out with some of that. But That's I nice. mean, it's still. <laughs> a chunk of money yeah you know for yeah. any anybody that is trying to work in in this economy that grew up during the recession like this is just not the group of people that can afford the financial situation that you're put in when you're trying to do some of the different processes that danielle mentioned earlier no it's certainly not easy for, for a lot of people um, again i'm lucky being in the uk that we have the health service here which, which covers everything through your taxes which i'm very thankful for um but in in other places around the world in the us you know it's not that easy and, and can cost a lot of money to do these things mm-hmm. yeah and i really wish i really wish that we had the infrastructure within the hd community to offer support for people in our situation um yeah. i feel like when you look so like um my friend is jewish and they get tested for cystic fibrosis and they have couples that have like or not couples they have grants for couples that need to do ivf and other things to make sure that their kids aren't born with cystic fibrosis and that's really nice to see and i wish that i hope that for the future of the hd community that 
we can move into that. I know that there's a nonprofit in the UK called Phil's Kids. Yeah. K for IVF, but it would be great if we could expand that to any like reproductive needs anyway. for anybody that has HD. Yeah. I and know. What's, what's that one? There's yeah. One in- yeah. There's one. There's a new one in the US, I think, uh, a foundation that just the started. Facebook. Yeah, I don't remember his name, but it's. Uh, I think that they they actually were successful in like fundraising for a ton of families for their round one. So it, it's re- it's been really successful. Yeah, they, have, they have a lot of money. They started a few years ago. So it's um, I forget his name. Sorry, I'm doing disservice. I've been, I follow him on Instagram, like the whole story. Yeah. I can't remember. Sorry, no, oh, I did not Facebook even know about that. Twice. Yeah, it's a big big uh, story. Twice. Oh, oh gosh, oh, no, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, no, I accidentally stumbled onto Phil's kids on Facebook. Um, yes. And so I love them. I know that they're they're yeah. pretty small though, and only in the UK. So that's the only one that I had no- I had known about. Yeah. But I mean, there are grants for people just doing IVF. Um, but I mean, if you're doing just the IVF and you do get a grant for that, I think yeah. you just need to take into account the cost of just the PGD part, because that in of itself costs money. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that charity in the US deals with uh, um, just IVF, PGD, or prenatal and other things as well. I don't know. I think they've been campaigning PGD, but I don't know what, what their kind of fine print is on that. Um, but it's worth finding out. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so how did you guys feel about the prospect of having to abort if it was positive um how what kind of thought process did you to go through there because that's obviously the, the big point here with prenatal um i, I mean it, it's obviously a hard thing like a hard conversation to have um uh, with your significant other uh, husband at that time it, my my boyfriend um uh, again, I was just very confident in knowing what I wanted because as soon as I found out uh, about HD that I had it, that my mom had it, I knew that I, and I'm an only child, so I knew that I was going to be the last one in my family, whatever that meant in any way. Um, so I felt like if I had let this happen um, without my IVF plan, that I I already knew what I had to do. And um I personally, I know there's a lot of opinions on this. I personally feel like if I can take one small step of not having another generation of HD, that that's a way that I can give back to the community because this is also, a, even though it's this rare, confusing disease, we people do have the opportunity and choices when it comes to reproduction, which is awesome. Um, yes. But it was it was not easy. I mean, I especially when you see you go for your scans, right? And you see this little, this little person and you're like, oh, well, okay, that's, that's different. And then you start to become attached to the idea. Um, but I, I, I just knew that I had to do it. Riley? Um, for me, I think, I, I mean, first of all, I've always been pro-choice just in general. So I, I don't think it started like, I think that it was always something that I knew was on the table if it had to happen. Um, but for me, I think that the alternative being IVF, assuming that somebody was going to do that, you're going to have embryos to dispose of anyways that are HD, mm-hmm. HD embryos. Because what are you going to do, donate that those embryos to somebody to have a kid with HD? The whole point is to stop it, right? So Yeah you know, you're going to either have to pay for those embryos for the rest of your life, and then they're going to get disposed of anyways, or you dispose of them right away because storing them is expensive. (laughs) Um, And I don't know how that's much different. I I think at least that's how I felt about it, uh, especially because it was so early. Um, I did try it, like, uh, I also try and juxtapose position sorry blah words today (laughs) um the idea of me telling my kid one day I had the option to make sure that you weren't going to have this and I didn't do it yeah because I think my aunt and uncle are in that situation they decided to have kids and they had the financial means to make sure those kids didn't have HD and now those kids are teenagers and they're gonna have to tell those kids (laughs) 
you might have HD. Uh, your sibling might have HD. Also, by the way, your dad is dying of HD, which, by the way, I forgot to tell you <laughs> for the last 15 years. Um, and I don't think, I just couldn't, I couldn't, the idea of having to tell my kid one day, I could have stopped this. I could have made sure that you weren't in this situation. And I chose not to because I was scared of getting an abortion. Yeah. I think that that's something inherently like when you're deciding to be a parent, my decision to have a child means that I want them to have a better life than me. And I want to set them up for success on the front end. So the abortion and my feelings about the abortion come down on me and the consequences of those feelings affect my kid. So, you know, I don't think, I don't feel like that's fair to a child to, you know, put those feel like the consequences of those feelings on them for the rest of their life and every other generation afterwards. Yeah. What if my kid goes out and decides to <laughs> really love being a mom or a dad and they have 10 children <laughs> and now, yeah. you know, everything I could have stopped is all happening all over again. Yeah. It's a generational kind of ripple effect. And I agree. It's like you make these decisions to, to, you know, to protect and support even when they're, they aren't here yet, you know, and it's just in the early stages. Um, And that's, I think that, you know, that's kind of how I feel. And I think about it now that McKenna is going to be turning two. And there are times where I still think about my decision and, if we were to go through this again, would I be able to abort now that I've had my, you know, my first child? And I think it would be harder, definitely, this time around, because, uh, you know, when I'm younger, I don't, I didn't know what it was like to to have that child to feel that love. But I still feel like I would, I would fiercely want to protect and as much joy as maybe that child and they wouldn't get sick until they're 60, or maybe there's going to be a cure. Hopefully there is in 10, 20 years, I, I can't, I can't ride on that. Like for me, I, I hope, I hope that I, you know, I'm non-symptomatic and I hope that in the next few years there is, but I, I can't do that to my child. And then God forbid that they have juvenile and, you know, it's just, it's, it's a hard, hard decision. Probably one of the hardest things that I would ever have to do. Um, but I still feel very confident in my decision and would, would, would do it again. Yeah, I mean, have, <laughs> having children is such a personal decision, isn't it, in Huntington's community, and each couple have their own thoughts about it, and, you know, one couple might not, would never do prenatal, would never do abortion, um, which is totally fine, and then there's, you yeah. know, the couples that would totally do that to get what, what they want to get to, so it's it is what it is and i think i've spoken to enough people in the hd community where it's just like you do what you need to do to to be comfortable with that um and don't judge other people for what they do really Um, yeah there's no judge yeah there's no judging on my end i got it's that's my decision and everything that i do with my health my life my choices my my choice um if i'm talking to somebody else and they decide to that they really want kids and they're going to go through i'm never going to lecture or it's their choice um and that's how it has this community people like you said people have to make decisions and and that's fine yeah i think the judgment has really been a huge limitation in access to information and i think that's inherently unfair uh because it's you know it is my i mean the way i see it it's my body so it's my decision like what you guys are saying and me not having access the information which a lot of I find a lot of people in the HD group who on Facebook who bring it up just don't even know or their doctors don't know Mm. and I just wish that there wasn't so much judgment around these decisions because if there wasn't then we would go to HD conferences and there would be actual booths and people that are there to talk to you about your options and be real with you yeah. And or, you know, you're going to the yeah. HD 5K and there's a booth there to, for somebody to talk to you about family planning. And I just feel like that's such a lacking thing in our community. It would be less and I would definitely like to see more of it, like the fact that we're even doing this webinar. Like, I was so excited to be able to be part of this because it just this information needs to be out there. People need to know what all of their choices are. 
Uh, and the judgment, the judgment around it just makes it, it like it's just so unfair because you're limiting access to information when yeah. you shut down, when you shut down the conversation. Yeah, I totally agree. Definitely. I have two more questions, folks. Okay. And then Danielle can go back to work. <laughs> I have to go pick up McKenna at daycare. Oh, okay, the work's over. <laughs> work's over. Thanks, boss. Please let <laughs> Told him I was busy. I'm busy today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, when you guys got the results, I mean, you know, the negative, um, how did how would you guys feel? How did you react? And also kind of like, where are you now? Uh, I mean, I know Riley, you're just kind of, you're going through that pregnancy. Danielle, you, you've got your two year old. So, I mean, how are you guys feeling about how you, where you are now? And, um, you know, are you happy that you, you went that route basically? Yeah, I can, I can go. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Um, I, when I got the results, obviously it was, I, I was kind of numb. Um, it, it takes, I think I was so stressed out waiting that when I got the call, I, I just had to let it sink in a little bit and I, it was a phone call, right? So I get this, I get a phone call during my work day and I'm, okay, yeah, well, um, great news. And I'm like, seriously, because the last few calls from any genetic counselors or any, you know, HD centers, have not been of great. <laughs> so I was like, really? Wow. Okay. So, um, you know, and then you're, you're a little like, um, is this true? Like, you sure you got the test right? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it just, it took a little while for me to, uh, to fully trust that they weren't going to call back and say, no, no, we got that wrong. Uh, but after that, you know, then it was, I could have the excitement and we can tell people and, and it was nice. And um, it was for me, I don't know why I felt very, uh, I, like I had to kind of be vocal about the fact that she didn't have um, the gene. And because I, I just, I was proud about that. And I knew that because I do a lot of advocacy and I'm so open with like talking with people and just my journey and my opinions on it. Um, I felt like when people, when they knew McKenna came as a surprise, if I didn't tell them that she didn't have the gene that they, everyone was questioning. And I know that people were because people later had asked me, so will McKenna get tested? And I was like, oh no, she already is. Um, so I, I was really happy. And I mean, I'm just happy that she'll never really have to, I mean, to worry about it herself. You know, I, I can't wait to, for her to be old enough and for me to be able to have a conversation and explain it to her how really lucky she is. Um, that's gonna be important for me. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're all in a good spot, as good as a dealing with a two-year-old can, can be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that before. My son's also two and is a crazy soccer, but, but yeah, <laughs> I, I love him very much. <laughs> They, they, they say terrible twos for a reason. And they're like one and a half. You're like, they're so cute. Look at them learning their first words. And then they hit two and they're just like crazy little, like they're climbing up bookshelves. And you're like, what happens? Where's my baby? <laughs> you got it to look forward to, Riley. Yeah. How are you feeling about it all, Riley? Um, so I am 22 weeks as of Wednesday. So I'm like more than halfway there. So that's been fantastic. But I just remember, I don't know, I just, I have a lot of feelings about uh, me having HD in the sense that it's so generational. So I think about my relationship with my husband and the fact that he's going to be my caretaker and he's going to have to watch me die one day. And I, you know, there's no stopping that. That's coming. But now we know for sure that he's not also going to have to watch his child die because what really struck me when I called all my family members and I told them that I had it for them, it was, I think it was like re-traumatizing because I think my grandma started bawling. My aunt, so everyone started crying like when I was on the phone with them because they had watched my dad be a caretaker and watch his mom die and now my dad is showing symptoms and we're trying to caretake for him, um, although he is doing really well. And I, we're really lucky in that sense. Um, and now they're, they're going to have to watch their niece and granddaughter go through it. And we're just at a point in time where people live long enough to watch three or four generations of people get sick. And... 
to be able to protect my husband from having to watch his own child die after knowing that he's committing to watching me die, which is an amazing thing in of itself. Um, it just felt like life altering. It just like was like, it was so reinvigorating. Like I could feel it like in my soul. It made me so happy beyond words. And I mean, I'm happy that I'm going to tell this kid one day how amazing and everything Danielle said, but also like, to stop that the whole generation saying <laughs> that they're never going to have to have this they're never going to need this podcast and they're never going to I mean I can't help I can't help them having to watch me die but that's going to be the last that's going to be the end of it and then they're going to go on and have their own kids and it's going to be over and it's going to be this thing that does not exist in the family and I have just watched it tear so many families apart and watched it destroy so many families and to know that that's never going to be their future and um that I'm removing that from (laughs) all the like from all of the futures that this kid could have it's just not going to happen and that makes me feel oh my gosh I'm (laughs) sorry it means a lot to me I I am definitely so happy that I did what I did and I'm so happy that I had those uncomfortable conversations when I was dating my husband about okay well this yeah. is what I'm doing and you either need to be on board or we shouldn't be dating and I've been prepping for this in so many different ways and for it to be done and you know have such a positive outcome and I know we were lucky to have that the first time because that does not happen to everyone um I just feel really good about it I feel really lucky um and I really feel like it's my job to take that goodness and try and put it back into the HD community by making sure people know what their options are and being a voice of success. Yeah. And that's a real, I think you said something important. I mean, just for, you know, the husbands and um, the caretakers, you know, and it's, it's obviously on either end, husbands or wives, um, that's a reality, right? That could be a whole other series um, of, of conversation. And sometimes, honestly, I, I try to push it out of my head. Um, I have to. And there are days, though, and now that I have McKenna and she's older, that it, um, I think I've had issues with that, if I'm being really open and honest, um, because it can take my breath away of me getting anxious of like, I'm going to have to leave her and that in itself, even though I know she doesn't have it and I'm grateful for my time. Now I'm like, uh, like she's here and I, how, how much time do I have? And that, um, you know, that's just, that's the reality of it, but it's still, it's not like that feeling just is like, Oh, it goes away. It's, I think it's something that Mm -hmm. people have to really think about because for anyone it's it's a it's a hard a hard thing yes i i can definitely relate to that one as well you oh have time. Huntington's. yeah <laughs> Take the most of the time that you have and yeah prepare for things as much as you can really all we can do yeah okay one more question okay uh any advice for future young people couples going through this Mm, definitely Um, yeah reach out to an hd center of excellence Mm -hmm. they all have social workers um my social worker happened to be uh on family leave or like on an emergency family leave when all this was going on for me so you know that wasn't a great resource in the moment but the centers of excellence are amazing. They're the people that know what they're talking about. So even if you just have a regular doctor, you need to reach out to somebody who actually knows about HD. Because I've heard the wildest stories. And yeah. people are telling me telling me things that I know are not true. And they're like, oh, they said I couldn't do CV sampling at all. And I would have to wait until I was five months pregnant and to do the amnio. And they're like, that's not a real thing. Like, <laughs> you need to make sure that you're getting realistic accurate information so the people you want to reach out to if you were looking for next steps (laughs) and i mean um would be a genetic counselor anywhere i think 
and then an HD center of excellence, which those are everywhere. Um, those would be my biggest recommendations. I don't know. Uh, that's, I mean, I think those are my two key pieces of advice because those are the people who are going to actually be able to help you the most. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, there's so much misinformation, especially just in testing. And I've talked, I'm just surprised. Actually, I'm not even surprised anymore when you talk to certain doctors, <laughs> talk to certain doctors and they, they're like, what's Huntington's? And I'm like, oh man. Um, but I think, I think finding um, support and a counselor that understands and goes through, goes through this, um, you know, it, it even, I think going through um, that process and reaching out to one of the centers of excellences, but also using HDO as a, a sounding board, there's tons of people. I think it's just getting connected and asking to talk to somebody who's been through this. Um, you know, I'm always happy to, to kind of guide somebody or connect people, um, but find people that know what they're talking about and it'll help you um, kind of speed up the process and, um, and, and don't, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions, you know, just be smart, think about what you want and then show up with a list of questions and just, just start taking it, like, just go through it. And don't be afraid to post in the Facebook groups. I yeah. think sometimes that can feel overwhelming because sometimes there's not always great feedback, but my best responses and the best, the best thing I ever did was post that Facebook post that I really was uncomfortable posting. Yeah. Um, it has given me so much more than I could ever articulate right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's such a good idea to take that chance because you can always delete it afterwards <laughs> yep. if you don't like it. Very true. Well, thank you, you two. That was very informative. I appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. It was nice to meet you, Riley. It was nice to meet you too, Danielle. Thanks and for good, the invite. Yeah, and good luck with your pregnancy. Thank you. Absolutely, all the best, Riley. Um, and keep us updated with how things go. Um, and yeah, uh, Danielle, go pick up your child. We'll do some more work, whatever you feel like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna go check if my son's asleep. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, Bye. I'll stop the recording. Bye. We appreciate that. Bye-bye, folks. Bye. Bye. Okay.